For the first time after the restaurant, they went to Nancho's place. Before that, all their meetings had been limited to sitting in a restaurant, but here he invited her to his place. Apologizing, he said, Honey, I ate something at the restaurant. I think it was oysters. My stomach's a little twitchy. I hope you don't mind if I take a little time in the bathroom. And the apartment is all yours. Sure, run along. The phone was ringing insistently, maybe something urgent. Selma took her cell phone from her purse, turned it on, and got two incoming calls from her husband. The first call was when they left the restaurant, the second one three minutes ago, while they were climbing the stairs to the third floor. She pressed the call, it rang after the fifth or sixth ring, she was about to hang up, and the caller answered. Yes, Mom, I'm listening. Letitia, where's Dad? Why did he call and why are you still up? Dad knows I'm in a business meeting and can't answer right away, but he's still drumming. I'm embarrassed in front of my co-workers. Mom, aren't you sick of lying to yourself? You, for some reason, for the last three months, some daily business meetings until 2100 in the club Blue Hollow. And all the bills are paid by you. I don't get it. What does this famous men's club have to do with business meetings? Plus, I don't understand what Nancho has to do with businessmen. Everyone knows who he is, even though he just showed up in Sebastian. He has a wife who's away today, and a jealous husband. This Nancho lives off rich women. Basically, he's a common Alfonso. I guess his wife will throw him out on the street soon. Yes, as for Dad, he wanted to talk to you about it, but he never got through, so he put his things in the car. Letitia, what are you talking about? Who's Nancho? What kind of things did Daddy put in the car at 10 o'clock at night? Come on, Mom, we've known all along. You're at your lover's place at 135 Carliccio, Aptor 16. Maybe he's lying next to you listening to our conversation. Thanks for calling. Hold on a second. A conversation between my daughter and her younger brother played in the background on the phone. Julio? No, we're not taking the robot. I know your mom gave it to you. But today... We all lose something more valuable than a radio-controlled robot. I promise I'll buy you one just like it. Now put it in your room. Further, into the receiver, Letitia said, Mom, Dad and I have talked, and we've made a decision. We're leaving you. I'm a big girl, I'm 17 years old, and I can decide which parent I want to live with. As for Julio, he's six years old, but Dad said he can't entrust his upbringing to a strange man, and you won't have time to take care of him because you're a businesswoman. Remember, long ago when Daddy proposed to you to become his wife, he also told you that if one day you meet and love another man, he will not hold you back and interfere with your happiness. So he does not interfere. That's it. I don't have time. I still have to pack and get Julio ready. The phone rang with a dial tone. Salma was dumbfounded. Because of some petty stupidity, her bad whim, she was losing her reliable rear. She was destroying her family, which she loved, her husband, without whom she could not imagine further life. At that moment, Nancho came out of the bathroom, naked, beautiful in his own way, but somehow very disgusting at the moment. He went towards Salma, but she shied away from the embrace. She slipped into the bathtub, where she grabbed her clothes and jumped back into the room and began frantically dressing. Nancho, not realizing what was happening, asked, What's wrong? Is there some kind of trouble? Yes, Salma replied, and very big, but I have two questions for you. What is your orientation? And the second question, what is your business? Well, I don't know, Salma. You know in this hectic life of ours, not everything is so straightforward. Stop dodging. I asked specific questions, and I don't need water. Answer yes or no to the first question. And what business are you in specifically? Okay, to the first question, I will say, yes, I am an extraordinary person, and I have a husband, and my wife knows about it. For the second question, I will explain that I am not yet engaged in a specific business. I am in search of a niche. Okay, I see. Now get dressed quickly. I have to get home right away. I think it's in your best interest. 
My husband found out everything about us, including your address, and he's on his way somewhere. And he's a master of hand-to-hand -hand combat. If he comes here, we'll be in trouble. Nancho's face changed, and he began to frantically gather himself, reasoning that he had never had anything with Salma, except for friendly meetings at the restaurant in the evenings, that he had a husband he wasn't cheating on. Salma found it funny to listen to this babble. Nancho turned out to be a total jerk. In another ten minutes, they were in the car, which flew through the streets of the Night Sebastian to another part of the city. In twenty minutes, safely past all the traffic lights and streets, stopped. Salma jumped out of the car, throwing to her frustrated lover on the way. Don't call me again. I don't want to hear or see you. And about the money loan, I'm not giving you any money. After which she ran to her yard. Her car, which was also used by her husband, was parked in its usual place on the third floor, and the light was on in their kitchen. Everything was business as usual. Taking a breath, Salma thought, Letitia, her daughter, was just playing a trick on her, even though everything was just as she said. She had indeed forgotten her family, her husband, Sergio. They hadn't even been intimate for five months, since Sergio and the kids went on vacation. When she returned from vacation, she just didn't have time for that, plus all those evening meetings with that cretin Nancho at the Blue Hollow Club. When she reached her floor, she took a breath and opened the door with her key. Slowly, without turning on the light in the hallway, she threw off her coat, took off her shoes, and walked into the lighted kitchen. On the table was her daughter's cell phone, and next to it, carefully rolled up in a small blanket, was her dinner. Strange, Salma thought. Letitia never parted with the phone, and here she had forgotten it. She decided to take it to her and talk to her to see what had happened half an hour ago. Noiselessly treading, she walked to her daughter's room, opened the door, and slipped into the darkness to light her way around the room and picked up the phone. The dim light of the phone picked out a neatly draped couch with cushions from the darkness. Taking a step back, Salma turned on the overhead light. The room was empty. On the draped couch, among the cushions, sat Letitia's favorite doll. Her face was covered with felt-tipped pens and tears, in the shape of broken hearts, had been drawn on her face, flowing from her eyes. Still not believing what she saw, Salma rushed into the next room, to her son, Julio. Immediately she turned on the light, the bed was made, everything neatly tidied up. There was a robot near the table, and on the table lay the remote control to control it. There was no one in the room. She quickly went into the hallway, took her cell phone out of her purse, and dialed her husband's number. A phone call was heard in the bedroom. They hid in the bedroom. A saving thought flashed. I walked in, turned on the light, and the bedroom was empty. The wide double sofa bed was spread out. Sergio's half was neatly covered with a blanket. The other half, on which Salma slept, was just as neatly spread out, only the corner of the blanket was flirtatiously tilted, inviting to sleep. The telephone ringing came from the closet, and Salma opened the doors of the large section, wondering how Sergio and the children could hide there, but the section was empty. The sound was coming from the small section. She opened it and found that the box in which she kept her valuables, including cash, was ringing. It must be said that the amount of money she had in there was considerable. Having disconnected the call, she took out the box and sat down on the sofa bed. The box contained untouched money. There were also envelopes of money that Salma left monthly for Sergio for household expenses. He hadn't even opened them. Sergio's cell phone and wedding ring were also in there. Separate from everything, at the very bottom, was the monthly printout from the bank that came to Sergio's computer. These were Salma's expenses for the past three months. Highlighted in color were her payments at the Blue Hollow Club and restaurant. How could she have forgotten about that? It was only then that she realized what had happened and what she had done. She had lost the dearest, the most valuable thing in her life because of her own stupidity, out of stupid vanity, because of some unintelligent attempt to imitate someone. She had lost her family, her beloved husband, her children.
tears ran from her eyes. Collapsing on the bed, she began to sob at the top of her voice. And then it was morning. No, not as it had been before, when she woke up confident in herself and in the future, feeling that great things awaited her. She did not sleep at night, sobbing and forgot herself only in the morning. Only when she woke up, she found that she had fallen asleep without even undressing. And now she had to decide what to do next, how to restore what she had lost by her stupidity, how to get back her beloved husband and children. After thinking for a while, I took out my cell phone, digging through its phone book. I dialed the number I wanted to forget and hadn't called in over two months. Oh, Her Majesty, Salma, down with me, plebeians. Vera, it's good to hear from you too. And forgive me, I'm a fool, I'm an idiot, and you were right. I'm in grief. Sergio left me with the children, and I don't know what to do now. Salma burst into tears again. Salma, calm down. What happened? I'll call your Sergio and talk to him. But tell me exactly what happened. Vera, there's no one to call. He left his cell phone, the kids left their cell phones too, and I don't know where they went. Leticia told me yesterday that they decided to leave me. Salma sobbed again. Salma, are you home now? Yeah, I'm home. I'll feed my men and I'll be there in about 20 minutes with Pedro. He's on the police force, so I think you're going to need his advice. Salma went into the hall, sat down in an armchair, and waited for her friend and her husband to arrive. About half an hour later, the doorbell rang. Salma got up, opened the door and went into the kitchen and turned on the kettle. Vera and Pedro undressed in the hallway, and also went to the kitchen, where they used to have their friendly gatherings. But now the only thing missing was Sergio, the Joker, and Funny Man. Listen, friend, Vera turned to Salma. Have you seen yourself in the mirror today? You're scarier than death itself. Well, sit down and tell us everything, but everything honestly and without secrecy. I think we can understand you, Salma cried, but she pulled herself together and realized that Vera and Pedro were not strangers to her and were probably the only ones who sympathized with her and could really help her. She told everything as it happened, without concealing or embellishing anything. After her story, there was silence, which was finally interrupted by Pedro. What a mess you've made of things, but from the looks of it, someone really ratted you out. I know Sergio. He wouldn't stoop to following you, although from what's been going on, he didn't have to. Constant delays, bills to pay at the men's club, which, by the way, made it obvious you weren't in meetings or at the entrepreneur's club. But let's not analyze your behavior but let's think about what Sergio could have done. Especially given the information you've given me, I think his leaving with the children was not spontaneous. It was a deliberate and well-considered decision, and given Sergio's four years of service in hotspots, all in intelligence, he thought it through. It's not worth going to the police for a missing husband and children. They probably won't look for them. There's no probable cause. The kids are with a father who can't hurt them, Besides, Letitia's 17 years old. And yes, I remembered, our Teresa, and she goes to the same school as Letitia, said she saw Uncle Sergio leaving the principal's office about 10 days ago, but didn't pay much attention to it. I think both Letitia's school and Julio's kindergarten will be different now. But we need to check it out. I'll ask our girls from the guardianship office to do it quietly. One more question. What did he drive away in? Your car's parked in the yard. Maybe he called a cab. We'll try to find out through the dispatchers who worked these days and drove people from this address yesterday. Of course, we should check his place of employment, but that won't be until Monday. I think he took a vacation. Although, I don't think he's taken any vacation time recently, so he's on his own dime. But there are people there, so we'll work through them. I don't think he quit because he liked his job so much. Vera supported her husband by saying, That's all true, but you can check the school today. The kids are in school, especially with New Year's Eve coming up, two weeks away. Maybe Leticia's at school, or maybe someone in the class knows where she transferred to. Salma, what grade is she in? There are three graduating classes. I'm ashamed. But I don't know. 
I don't even know what kind of kindergarten Julio goes to. Sergio said that he was transferred to another kindergarten where a preparatory group was formed for the children who were going to school the following year. I know that Sergio bought groceries for the house every Saturday on the Madrid highway. He took Julio with him. While I was asleep, they'd go to the market to buy groceries. Jesus, Vera said. What did you do around the house? And why didn't he go to the giant for groceries? It's two steps away from you. It turns out that I did nothing. Sergio cooked, cleaned, washed, ironed, took care of the children, solved their problems, helped me with my work, and still worked. I don't even know when he had time for everything. Salma cried again. Stop crying. Vera stopped her sobbing. Finding him and the children doesn't seem that hard to me. There's another question. What will you tell him when you find him? If you say that you are going to go to bed with a lover, he will send you, and apparently, and the daughter, very far away. Well, we didn't have anything. Yeah, it was 15 minutes short. It was just a coincidence that you had enough sense to call home, and that's why everything went wrong with your lover, Vera sneered. Anyway, you can say that he wasn't your lover, you never had anything, just a friendly conversation. Then his wife left, and he wanted to surprise her, beautifully furnish the kitchen, asked for advice. So you stopped by for five minutes, didn't even take off your fur coat. The truth that you were already naked in bed is inappropriate, especially for Sergio. In fact, you've already cheated on your husband. And turning to her husband, Vera said, Pedro, you find this asshole and explain to him that it was like I just said, in case Sergio meets him somewhere. Also, Salma, did he leave him for someone else? Sergio's an enviable guy. A lot of people would have had their eye on him. Pedro intervened in the conversation. What are you saying? Sergio and another woman. No, he's a one-woman man. But if he thinks there's been an affair, he'll never forgive. He'll suffer, but he won't forgive. After that, the tasks were distributed. Who, what to specify, and where. Advice was given to each other on what to pay attention to when searching. It was decided not to tell anyone anything about what had happened. It seemed that there were no difficulties, or rather, only one. Namely, the conversation between Salma and Sergio. What will Sergio believe, and will he forgive, Salma? And then, further on, time showed that everything was smooth on paper. Day after day, they combed the city, kindergartens, schools. There was no sign of Sergio or the kids. Sebastian's not a small town. It had a large population, and the fact that they searched covertly, trying not to publicize what had happened, did not help the search. Winter passed imperceptibly. Spring swiftly swept by, and summer came to an end. The last decade of August came, and fall was ahead. Salma devoted herself to her work and the search for her husband and children. Nothing else existed for her. Vera and Pedro consoled her as best they could, trying to give her hope, especially as every day there were fewer and fewer places left unexplored and untested. And so Salma, who was in her office, received a call from Vera, who said that today she had met a classmate, Rosita, on the street. In conversation, she said that recently, returning from vacation, she had met Sergio and the children on the firm express from Madrid. They, too, were on their way back from vacation. They were vacationing on the Mediterranean coast somewhere in a Spanish resort. In talking to them, she learned that Leticia had enrolled in the institute they were also attending. Soon, she would begin her student life. As for Julio, he had entered first grade, but she didn't specify which school. Was very happy for Salma and Sergio. Already in Sebastian, she looked, wanted to give them a ride home, but never saw them in the crowd. And she met them, somewhere in front of Santero, where exactly she doesn't remember. But the Signature Express only makes five stops to Sebastian. What does that do? Five stops, that's five more cities. And we won't be able to find Letitia until the school year starts, Salma said. No, mother, that's not true. Pedro is in Madrid on duty. I've already called him back. 
He'll go to the Institute to the Study section and look at the file of the applicant, now a student, and find out her address. I hope she hasn't changed her last name. And Pedro's coming tonight. So, uh, get over here by six hour. All right, it's decided. I'll be there. Only he could have called back from Madrid, Salma said. No, he couldn't. It's like a bad movie. His phone's battery died and he left the charger at home. Anyway, I'm waiting for you tonight. An hour after Vera's call, the cell phone rang again, calling Santiago, the unspoken leader of the club of selected entrepreneurs. Salma, my dear Salma, what are you doing out of town? You don't show up at the club, although I know your business is doing well economically. Anyway, there's a man here who wants to talk to you. I think you'll find common interests with him. So drive up by 17 Zulu. I think the meeting will take you no more than 20 minutes. Santiago, I will drive up, of course, but really briefly, as I have an important appointment at 6 p.m. At exactly 16.55, Salma arrived at the Entrepreneurs Club. At the entrance, she was informed that Santiago was waiting on the second floor, in the room for business meetings. She went up to the second floor, entered the room. There was Santiago with a pretty woman, the same age as her, dressed inexpensively but tastefully. When Santiago saw Salma, he became animated and introduced the woman sitting across from him. Meet Gabriela, one of our most prominent business ladies. I think you've heard of her. There isn't a business in Sebastian that she doesn't have a piece of. And with that, I'll leave you to say goodbye, as I'm also a little busy. Santiago bowed to the ladies and left, saying on the way that he would send her her favorite coffee, keeping in mind Salma's tasties. Salma said hello to Gabriela and sat down at the table across from her. While waiting for coffee, the women looked at each other and were silent. The waiter came, brought coffee with specialty cookies. He asked if there was anything else he wanted and left immediately. Gabriela was the first to speak, taking a sip of coffee. Obviously, I didn't ask you to set us up for coffee, and since I'm a businesswoman, I'll get right to the main topic. But in order to do that, I need to know what kind of relationship you have with your husband? I don't know, but I think business is business, and my family affairs are not really my business, Salma replied. Gabriella continued, Okay, let's switch to you since we're the same age. And here's a quick backstory. The thing is that last December, I divorced my husband, with whom we lived, if I may say so, for about eight months. I know that he had been dating intensely lately. Since I was not interested in him, and to the point, as a man, he was not worthwhile at all. I just ignored him. Last October, I met a man I loved sincerely, and he reciprocated. You may know him, he was in your husband's class, but your husband was on sabbatical, and Juan graduated a year early. He was assigned to Santero, where he gradually made his career and became director of a manufacturing company under my supervision. Last year, in November, we needed a strong, technically competent chief engineer for his company. Juan met Sergio, your husband, in Sebastian, offered him the position. Sergio thought for a week, accepted the offer, and in December, he moved to Santero with his son, Julio, seven, and daughter, Leticia, 18. They arrived in December. At that time, Juan purchased several cars in Sebastian for work. One Volkswagen Crafter provided Sergio, at his request, to transport his personal belongings, his family, and ferry the car to Santero. As far as I know, you stayed in Sebastian and never showed up in Santero. The perception there is that Sergio is divorced. I've appointed him CEO of the Santero Manufacturing Group to replace Juan. I took Juan back to Madrid. Sergio lives in Santero with his son and daughter. I am now looking for a candidate to become director of the Santero facility, which will produce products similar to those you produce in Sebastian. Your candidacy has been recommended to me, but I don't know how your relationship with the CEO will work out. I didn't divorce Sergio, and I'm not going to. It was just kind of stupid. I got involved with your ex-husband, Nancho. Well, we were just friendly after work at a restaurant. And you, of course, paid for all those parties, didn't you? Yeah, me. 
because he's always forgetting his money or his cards blocked. Don't feel bad. You're not the first person he's dumped. He's just a common Alfonso. Besides, he's a zero as a man, and he's already been punished by me. On December 17th last year, my guys caught him. We went with him to court, where we were divorced within 15 minutes, after which he was taken to the station and put on a train on the route to the north of the country. He was sent in what he was wearing, but they gave him a per diem for food so that he would not die on the way. Where he is now, I don't know. But he was strongly advised not to appear in Sebastian or Madrid again. Salma continued. Sergio found out about these meetings I was having at the Blue Hollow Club, and on December 15th, last year, without saying anything to me, he packed his bags, took the kids, and disappeared. I didn't say anything to anyone, except a close friend and her husband. We turned all of Sebastian out. But it turns out that's not where we were looking. I don't know how, but I'm going to get him to forgive me. After all, I did not cheat on him. I cannot live without them. I will not give them to anyone. And then Salma sobbed. Salma's tears were a complete surprise to Gabriella. She saw a pretty young woman sobbing with an inexpressible longing in her eyes. She quickly pulled herself together and said, Salma, calm down. I didn't realize things had gotten so bad. Here, drink some water and calm down. We're wise women and we've made something of our lives. I think you can reconcile with Sergio and the children. It's just that we, who have achieved something in life, should always remember that those with whom we started our lives with nothing should be there for us. Then when we rise up, around will hang men losers who always surround successful women dreaming to tear off a tidbit from them. They don't want us. They want our money. Gabriella hugged Salma and continued, If you need my help reconciling with Sergio, just let me know. No, I don't need help. I need their address where they live in Santero. I'm going there right now. I'll give you the address, but it's not wise to drive 150 kilometers tonight. Besides, you don't know the city. Leave early in the morning so you can be in Santero by 8 a.m., You'll get a good night's sleep and you'll be back to normal. Even with the greatest grief, we women must remain women and look like the envy of all. Gabriela called someone back, and within minutes, Salma had Sergio and the kids address in Santero and his cell phone number. Half an hour later, Salma was at Vera's and Pedro arrived. They checked their addresses and learned that Sergio and his children had gone to live in Santero. According to Leticia's student file, he was the chief engineer of an industrial enterprise. The address that Salma had gotten and the address that Pedro had brought coincided. As much as Salma wanted to go to Santero immediately, her friends dissuaded her and moreover told her that they would not let her go alone. And finally they decided that the morning is wiser and agreed that they would all go together at 5.30 in the morning. Given the road and the drive through Santero, they had to be there by 7.30 they decided not to call Sergio from the evening. And so the highway was behind them, a short search for an address in Santero, and they drove into the yard of a modern five-story building at 745. Just as they'd planned. They came to the entrance where they were blocked by a door with a code lock, but a woman coming out of the entrance gave them the opportunity to overcome this obstacle. The apartment they were looking for was on the third floor. They are already in front of the door. Pedro presses the doorbell, and they hear Leticia's voice. Come in. It's open. They enter the apartment, first into the corridor, then into the hall. In the hall, Leticia stood at the ironing board, ironing shirts, judging by their size, belonging to Sergio. The hall had four doors leading to other rooms. From the door of one of the rooms, Sergio's voice could be heard quoting poetry. Get up count. Already friends with cartoons. The horses are saddled near the porch. The townspeople are making joyful noises, ready to welcome the father in you. Don't furrow your brow. If you've sinned, it'll be a time to forget everything. Stand up. The world awaits your decision, to be or not to be, to love or not to love. Dad, what's a cartoon? Moltuk, son, is a Central Asian wick gun. We'll go to the gun museum in Sebastian someday. You'll see. 
Leticia, seeing Pedro, Vera, and Mama Salma, put the iron on the stand and called out, Dad, we have company. I'm coming. Whoever visits in the morning is wise, Sergio recited and left the room, holding Julio, who was asleep, in his arms. When he saw them, he put his son on the floor and looked around. Good morning, Pedro greeted him. Very kind, Sergio replied in his tone. Come in, don't be shy. Leticia, put on the kettle and water in the pot. We'll boil our dumplings, homemade. I don't think our guests have had breakfast today. Dad, I don't think they're here to eat your dumplings, Leticia said, but went into the kitchen. Well, while the water boils, we'll talk here, Sergio said, walking to the window and sitting down in a chair near the exit to the loggia. Julio immediately ran to his father and climbed on his lap, and Leticia quickly returned from the kitchen and sat next to him. Sergio, Vera said, you know why we're here, right? Not exactly, though there is some speculation, Sergio replied. But if you take the children, I will not give them up. If you get a divorce, there will be no objection on my part. I will not interfere with Salma's happiness. If on the question of the division of property, I have no claim to anything. Sergio, you're thinking about the wrong thing, Vera said. What am I supposed to think about? Salma's here and she's not talking. No, Sergio, I'm not silent, Salma whispered. I just look at you and the children and I can't speak. I have a lump in my throat. I've been looking for you for so long. Yeah. Salma suddenly fell to her knees in front of Sergio and the children, and with her head down, through her tears and sobs, she began to speak. Forgive me, I'm very sorry to you. I got carried away with my business and neglected my family, thinking that money was the most important thing. Because I was successful, I was euphoric about my success. I was just disconnected from reality. And you, you didn't tell me anything. What was I supposed to tell you? Are you a little girl? Don't you realize you can't go to restaurants and sleep in other people's beds with other people's uncles? And from that asshole's bedroom, I had a live feed on my phone. Then all the more reason for you to see that nothing happened between us. Yes, I went to restaurants with this nancho, but it seemed to me, in our conversations, I was just teaching him business, helping him become a successful businessman. But he was just scamming me for money, I realized that later. But nothing happened between us, I love you, and no one else can replace you. I beg you, children, give me a chance to stay with you. And Salma, on her knees, sobbed again. Letitia rose from her chair, came to her, lifted her up, and sat her down on the sofa next to her. Then she went into the kitchen and fetched water in a glass, which she gave to Salma. In the silence that prevailed, only her sobs were heard. Letizia sat down beside her father again, Julio hugging his father, looking at his sobbing mother with a frightened expression. At last, Letitia interrupted the silence. Mom, I don't decide anything. It's your life and Dad's. I can't advise him. I saw what he was like back in November and December, but you didn't see anything. I saw what it took for him to make the decision to leave you, and I'm grateful to him for taking me and Julio. Believe me, your breakup was very hard on me, too. Today, if you remember, I'm 18 years old. I'm going away to school in, like, two weeks. No one knows what will happen next, but I'll be an independent adult. As for Julio, I'm daddy's daughter, and he's daddy's son. For as long as I can remember, always in the most difficult moments and moments of joy, daddy was with us, but you were not. You were studying, working, resting after work. Daddy was also studying, also working, but he was always there. And turning to her father, Letizia added, Dad, it is up to you alone to decide how to proceed today, just as it was last December. I will accept any decision you make without offense or reproach. Sergio sat silent, his head slightly bowed. Outwardly, he looked completely calm, and finally, stroking his son's head as he sat on his lap, he said, I don't know about the sex. I don't know if it was or not. Letitia deleted the video from my phone before I found it. I didn't try to recover it. I wasn't interested. 
and my daughter said there was nothing there. I believe her. What's next? Vera, Pedro, where are your children today? Sergio, we have grown children and they can do without us for a couple of days, Pedro replied. Fine. Since I'm not ready to make a decision in this situation, and I need to think things over, I suggest we go to my house. Yes, you heard right, we have our own house. It's almost finished. It has all the amenities. I've already brought the furniture there. I'll have to do a little assembly and arrangement. There's a garden, a vegetable garden, a bathhouse, and a river nearby. But first, we'll have breakfast. Leticia, the water's boiling, throw in the dumplings. Julio, go wash up. And looking at Salma, Sergio added, I'm sorry, but I'm not ready to answer you now. Salma, head down and still holding the glass of water in her hand, whispered, Sergio, I understand everything. And just so you know, I love you. If you say no, I'll go back to Sebastian. If you say yes, I'll accept a job as director of production in Santero, in the company where you were appointed general manager. I'll be there for you and Julio. I am very much looking forward to your decision, and I hope it will be positive for all of us. For me, for you, for Julio, for Leticia. Leticia thundered. Everyone wash your hands and everyone to the table, and after another 25 minutes, everyone went outside. Salma and Julio got into the car with Sergio, and Leticia got into the car of Glory and Vera to show the way. On the way to the shopping center, Treasure Island, where, at the insistence of Sergio, were purchased swimsuits for Vera and Salma, as well as swimming trunks for Pedro. There, Sergio also bought a bunch of groceries, explaining that he had something growing in his vegetable garden, but it was not meat. And after another 25 minutes of driving over the bridge and the village, the cars stopped in the cottage village, Barsky Meadow, with picturesque residential complexes. Sergio pressed the button on the remote control, the gates opened, and they saw a beautiful three-level house. According to Sergio, the first floor of the three-story house had a kitchen, dining room, fireplace room, guest bathroom, and access to a courtyard with a warm pool. Under the house, there was an extensive basement. The second floor had three bedrooms, a huge balcony, and a bathroom. On the third floor, there was a spacious master bedroom with second light and bathroom, dressing room, ladies' boudoir, and a separate recreation area. Separately stood a two-story guest house. It had a full basement. On the second floor, two guest bedrooms with all amenities. On the first floor, a huge living room with second light, combined with kitchen and bar, as well as a shower room and toilet. A spacious sauna stood separately. Centralized gas, electricity, water supply, sewerage, satellite TV, and internet were connected to the houses. When did you become a capitalist? Pedro asked. Am I a capitalist? No, you're not. I bought the house almost finished. The old owner had gone bankrupt, and he needed money fast and to get out of the country. I needed a place to live, because the apartment we live in now belongs to our association and is used as a hotel. And this one asked for a little bit, although, to be honest, I raked out all my money reserves, a little bit borrowed from the bank. But now I am the owner of the house, and I will pay off the bank in time. Listen, aren't you scared to leave a place like this unguarded? Oh, Pedro, I have a letter of protection from the local bandits. When we bought the house and first came here in May, the locals showed up. They started hinting that they were the big shots and they had to pay. Leticia was coming back from the store. The guy in charge saw her and tried to hit on her. I tried to intervene, but Leticia took a step back and kicked him in the jaw. Just like they taught me. The poor fellow collapsed unconscious as if unconscious, and I picked up the shovel and slowly showed the wonders of it. They picked up the ringleader and left. But the next day, three cool cars came, as I realized. They came back with help. Out of the cars came a bunch of pumped-up bulls, and there was a big one, about my age, who looked like an experienced fighter. I sent Leticia into the house and told her to hide, and I went out, ready for a fight. This fighter saw me and said, Everyone, quiet. And turning to me, spreading his arms for a hug, said, Commander, I'm sorry. 
the boys didn't realize what they were up against. It was my second in command, Rojas. We served together on active duty. He was the one who gave the order to guard the house, no payoffs. But the one that Leticia knocked out started to resent him. Rojas told him he was lucky Leticia knocked him out. If it had been me, his funeral would have been today. After that, Kostya and I sat for a while, talked about life, learned that I work in Santero, said if you have any questions, refer to me. That's how the house got a security certificate, and the Barsky Meadow itself now has its own security. The guests were assigned to rooms. Vera and Pedro took a room on the second floor of the guest house. Leticia took her room on the second floor of the guest house. Julio took the room next to hers, and Salma took the room next door. According to the terms of occupancy, Sergio suggested that everyone clean up their rooms, and then that they all work together to clean up the common areas. During the day, everyone was busy assembling and arranging the furniture. Sergio cooked lunch with Salma and Vera helping him. Vera often left the kitchen, trying to leave Salma and Sergio alone. Julio and Pedro flooded the bathhouse, and towards evening the women went to bathe, followed by the men. After 20 minutes, Julio said that he had already bathed and ran into the house. Well, here's running to see my favorite movie, commented Sergio. Listen, Sergio, what have you decided with Salma? Pedro asked when they were alone in the steam room. You have no idea how everything that happened shook her. I had already forgotten that once she was cheerful and carefree. Now she's in tears all the time. Pedro, don't poison my soul. It wasn't easy for me, and it wasn't easy for the kids either. But we got through it. Leticia graduated with a gold medal. Julio can start third or fourth grade today, but I won't rush him. Although he'll be bored in elementary school, I've become a general director with a decent salary. I have five production companies under me. The advantage is that we're closer to Madrid than Sebastian. And the fact that Salma was appointed to one of the companies Honestly, I didn't know about the Founder's decision. I wasn't consulted. And if asked for your opinion, would you hire her as director, under you? I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Anyway, I'll tell you what. It's a night ahead. I'll think, I'll decide. And in the morning, in the morning, I'll announce my decision. And now, let's add more parka. Then we'll wrap ourselves in sheets and go in the anteroom for a cold beer with kebabs. It was noticeably darker and cooler outside. Sergio turned on a small light in the courtyard and invited everyone to dinner in the fireplace room on the first floor of the house. The wood in the fireplace crackled. The flames slowly devoured the wood. The table, set by Sergio and Leticia, was royal. There were plates with kebabs and sausages made during the day in the yard on the grill. The main course was a gorgeous sevruga made in the oven and decorated with cherry tomatoes and herbs. And from carrots, Leticia cut out orange roses, which decorated this fish. The first course at dinner was sturgeon soup. Among the appetizers were rosettes with red and black caviar, plates with red fish sandwiches, eggs with mayonnaise. Various drinks. Everyone seated themselves at the set table. Sergio and the children sat on one side of the table, and Salma, Pedro, and Vera sat opposite. Sergio took out a bottle of Jack Daniel's whiskey and poured himself and Pedro a drink. He offered the women a choice of whiskey, champagne, or white dry wine brought from the resort. The women decided on the white dry Spanish wine, which would go well with the fish dishes served. Pouring the wine for the adults, Sergio thought for a while and poured some for Leticia, saying that she was old enough. When he had finished with the adult liquor, he poured his son a glass of morsel and, raising his glass, began to make a toast. My friends, I raise my glass to you. Here's to that successful combination of the useful and the pleasant. We have all worked hard today to put this house in order, and it is a pleasure for me as a host to see you here, because you are my friends. I rest with you both in body and soul. You are the ones who give me food for thought. I realize that the purpose of your visit is quite different. You are here today as a sincere help of friends in the confusing labyrinths of my family life, 
in which I have to make a difficult decision for me. And in this difficult hour, our long-standing friendship means a lot to me. Here's to you, my friends. Glasses clinked, they drank and began the meal. After eating the fish soup, Vera said, Listen, Sergio, did you happen to choose the wrong profession? You've cooked an unparalleled, delicious, rich sturgeon soup. You've made a truly royal dish. But write me the recipe for sturgeon in the oven. Thank you, Vera, Sergio replied. The ear was really good. As for the profession, no, I was not mistaken. Men are always better cooks than women, only they hide it hard. As for the recipe, it's simple. The main thing in it, the main thing, is the roast sturgeon itself. We clean the starred sturgeon, gut it, remove the black film inside, cut out the gills, thoroughly wash under running water, splash the carcass with lemon juice. Garlic is peeled, pressed through a press. The garlic pulp is mixed with salt, and the resulting mixture is rubbed on the outside and inside of the starred sturgeon. Put the fish belly down on a baking tray, pre-greased with vegetable oil, Send it to an oven heated to 190 degrees Celsius. Bake it for 40 minutes. Ready Savruga lay out on a dish and decorate to your taste. Well, I entrusted the decoration to Letitia. That's the secret. Is it that easy? No, you have to put your heart and soul into it. Selma was silent during the meal. You could see how tense she was inside. After a couple of hours, the feast was winding down. No one wanted to eat. Everyone was quite tired. Julio, who had first sat at the table and then moved to the small sofa by the fireplace, fell asleep. Sergio carried him to his room on the second floor. Vera and Pedro went to the guest house, to the room they had occupied since their arrival. Soon the lights went out there. Salma, Sergio, and Letizia remained in the fireplace room. Sergio brought a large tray and began to remove the dishes from the table and carry them into the kitchen, assisted by Salma and Letizia. Letizia said, Dad, put all the dishes in the sink. I'll get up in the morning and wash them all. No, Letizia, you and Salma go to bed. Get some rest. You've had a hard day, too. That's when Salma remembered, I completely forgot. I brought Letitia's phone and your phone that you left, Julio's robot and Letitia's doll. It's all in the trunk of Pedro's car. Well, it's no big deal. Besides, Pedro and Vera are already asleep. Tomorrow will be the day. Now, girls, let's go to your rooms. I'll finish up here myself, clean up and turn it off, Sergio reasoned. Leticia and Salma went upstairs to their rooms. Leticia invited her mother up to her room. In the room, on the table... Salma saw a picture of Sergio, Letizia, and Julio standing in front of an obscure Gothic building. Intercepting her mother's gaze, Letitia explained that we were standing in front of the redemptive shrine of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. It's been under construction for 120 years, and the work is still going on. One of the world's longest-lasting buildings. It was designed by one of the greatest architects of the 20th century, Antoni Gaudi. My dad took us on vacation to the famous beaches of the Costa Bravo. We lived in Lloret de Mar, in a hotel called Capacabana. It's a 10-minute walk to the sea, and Barcelona is 100 kilometers away. Yeah, they're taking a long time to build, probably the longest in the world. Not quite. Milan Cathedral in Italy, where we also visited, took 579 years to build. It's the largest white marble structure in the world. You've traveled all over Europe, and I've been looking for you all over Sebastian. Mom, don't just sit there and wait. Go downstairs to Dad and talk to him. What else can I say to him? Thank you for erasing the video from his phone, even though there was nothing there. Mom, I don't know. I didn't watch it. I just immediately deleted those files when they showed up. I believe you that you had nothing to do with that man. I left with Dad because you were estranged from us. I didn't know we were moving to Santero. Go on, he's finished cleaning, he's done the dishes, and if not, you can help him. Salma stood up, looked at her daughter, and left the room. Sergio finished cleaning, washed the dishes. 
Then, after a moment's thought, he took out the whiskey, poured it into a glass, and at that moment, Salma entered the fireplace room, hugged him, and said, Pour me one. Morning came. Pedro woke up in the guest room, Vera sleeping serenely beside him. A merry squeal and laughter could be heard outside. Pedro walked over to the window. Julio and Leticia were splashing in the heated pool, which overlooked the windows of the room. On the other side, embraced, stood Salma and Sergio. Salma's face was radiant, looking at the children and smiling happily. Well, said Pedro to sleeping Vera, everything seems to be going well. Vera woke up and, unable to make out what was said, asked, What are you babbling about? Sergio saw Pedro awake and standing at the window, waved and gestured for him to join the morning bath. Nodding affirmatively, Pedro said to his wife, Wake up, sleepyhead, we're going swimming. In the morning? In cold water? It's crazy, Vera said, and stuck her head under the pillow. But Pedro yanked both the pillow and the blanket off her. No way. Quickly put on that swimsuit they bought you and look out the window to see how happy Salma is. Looks like Sergio made a positive decision.